record. There we go. Got it. Okay. Got it. Welcome to Leading Through Stories, but this time it's called Leading Through Connection because today we are actually face to face with some of our community and we are going to be talking about blind spots and strengths. Um, with me, as always, is Helen Rose, who's passionate about grief. Mary Michalithes, an educational leader, and of course me, Christy Wolf. I believe there is power in stories. Um, nobody here will be joining us for the first time, but if you're watching the recording, there will be show notes down below if you are interested in more information about who we are and why we got started with Leading Through Stories. So one of the things that um, we were talking about in our conversations um, with you monthly, you had given us some feedback that indicated that some of our 20 minute sessions were just way too short. And through some of our conversations with you um, online and through your feedback, some of you have indicated, oh, we want to be a part of a conversation, maybe have a glass of wine and sit with Christy and Helen and Mary to have a conversation. And so that's where we are today in looking at a more interactive session um, yes, we're going to be talking about strengths. Yes, we're going to be talking about blind spots. Um, there are a few ground rules for us to kind of uh, follow. They're simple and easy to follow. So ground rule number one, our conversations tonight are about telling our own stories. And um, as you know, we are recording today's session. And secondly, the second ground rule is we need to be mindful of the time that we take to share because sometimes our passion takes over us and Christy and Helen and I know that we've got a little signal, we've got a little a, a post-it note and that's just the indication that, um, okay, finish your thought, it might be somebody else's turn. And I know we've kind of showed that to each other often, Christy and Helen, because we're very passionate <laughs> about everything that we do. Wow. And then the third, third ground rule is to really reflect on the enjoyment of this conversation and companionship and um, to learn from one another as well. So we, uh, oh, uh, Caroline's having some internet connectivity issues. Well, we can't That's wait okay. to see your beautiful face, hon. Um, so one of the things we did was we asked ahead of time, we asked our community, what is one of your strengths and what is one of your blind spots? Well, and before we jump into it, can we introduce these guys? Are you guys okay with introducing yourselves? Sure. All right. Annette, take it idea. away. Me? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't. I didn't you said sure that. first, so I'm going to make you talk first. Okay. All right. Well, I have a nursing background. I was a healthcare executive for decades. Uh, I'm a speaker, author, freedom facilitator, and coach. And I've written the book, Forgiveness, The Mystery and Miracle. And I, I am in my late seventies and I love life and age is only a number. <laughs> and you drive a motorcycle. Please tell that story. Oh yes. I've ridden for 18, 20 years. I rode a motorcycles. My last motorcycle is a big, black, beautiful Harley with loud pipes and oh my lots God. of chrome. <laughs> but you also drove it. Talk about where you, the best place, not where you got, you and Clay have gone, but the, the time you were speaking, that's the best. Oh, part. I was speaking at a university in California and I rode down the aisle. They were having a an event and I was the keynote speaker for this group of more than 2000 students. And the gal that was, had invited me to speak when she realized that I was a biker, she said, would you like to ride a bike down the aisle? And I said, oh, I'd love to. So rode a bike right down the, right down the aisle in the auditorium. And boy, did I have that group of students in my, the palm of my hand. <laughs> Wow, I, I love, love that, that story. Oh, I jumped off the bike and ran up on the platform and I said, I've always been, I've always wanted to do this. <laughs> <laughs> just so everybody knows too, if you are seeing this, Annette has done a podcast with Helen that you can find on Helen's page. So if you want to hear yes. that chatting yeah. together yeah. too, yeah. that's a good beautiful story. Back. Yeah, sad story, but beautiful the way Annette tells it in what what she's done with her life with her story. Yeah. And stories are really important. I'm a I'm a storyteller, but I'm also a story listener, mm. you know, in the work that I do. So would it be okay uh, if I put that podcast link in our takeaway email? Absolutely. Fine okay. with me, yeah. 
Uh, I'm just making myself a note, so that's why I'm not paying attention. All right, our middle contestant, tell us about yourself. <laughs> oh, maybe you're not in the middle on your screen. Yes, lady in okay. red. Lady in my red. My name is Cheryl, and I'm Christy's mom. Oh, how <laughs> nice. There's more to it than that. Ah, uh, not really. <laughs> that's true. Uh, don't tell the siblings, siblings though. <laughs> Pardon me? I said, don't tell the siblings, though. <laughs> <laughs> I just returned from a trip to uh, Canmore where I looked after Christy's two little boys while she went off, flew off to Costa Rica for a week with her husband. Yeah. Wow. But I had fun with the boys. And Cheryl, what a blessing for those boys to have Nana or Grandma uh, be a part of their lives and, and for you as well to experience uh, that. Absolutely. Yes. Christy was, you know, excited that, you know, she could leave. And know that the kids would be well, well loved and cared for. So <laughs> yeah. looking forward to being a grandmother someday, but it doesn't look very promising. Just saying. So I will borrow anybody's kids, dogs, cats. <laughs> just saying. Never say never. <laughs> um, do you want to introduce Caroline? Mary? She can, Caroline, can, are, are you? I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think no, she's I got oh, there we go. Okay. I don't want Mary to introduce me. That would be really frightening. Oh. <laughs> okay, now so I want to hear Caroline. Oh, and then I hear if I if I if I disappear, I'll come back. Um, yeah, Caroline Gosling. Um, I'm an educator, similar background to Mary. I actually met Mary when we were both consultants in I don't know 1994. No, yeah, somewhere in there, 1994, I think it was. Um, and we actually had the pleasure of co-principling a school for a few years um, and now I've been involved for many many years in the area of restorative justice and restorative practices in schools and so now in my semi-retirement um, I'm doing a lot of work with schools and boards around that and also on creating welcoming caring respectful and safe learning environments so um, that's what I'm up to now. Well, that's kind of cool. I did. Um, have you ever heard of um, Judge John Riley? I'm sure you have. Yes. Yeah, I did a pod. He's actually a very good friend of mine uh, and Annette's too, I think. And yeah. uh, he uh, I, he did a podcast with me and he was talking about restorative justice because he was quite involved. He sat on the um, bench in Canmore and Cochrane, which is um, and had a lot of dealings with the uh, indigenous population and saw that it, they weren't being well served. So he, um, he really fought and he almost lost his career over um, what he wanted to do with restorative justice. Beautiful yeah. work actually, yeah. Helen, I think I heard him speak. So I sit on the Alberta Restorative Justice Association board oh, and I oh, think yeah, I heard him speak, he keynoted one of our conferences. Yeah, he, you yeah. probably did, yeah. There, now who's the gal, I don't think she's alive anymore that does the restorative justice. Um, she's got all the stories. I wanna say Mary, oh, I have her book. I'm not gonna go get it, but yeah. Very interesting concept. I think it's a it's a beautiful idea. Yeah, and actually, Annette, we crossed paths before at the conference. We I've have. We at have. Many I've, of the conferences. Yeah, I've spoken at several of the conferences, mm -hmm. and restorative justice is really in my heart. I look forward mm -hmm. to when Clay and I can get back into the um, into the prison system. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of work with inmates and lifers in particular. Yeah. Well, and my passion is getting that going in school so that maybe our students don't end up. <laughs> exactly. And that's exactly, oh, exactly where it needs oh. to start. Yeah, I, I agree. could tell you a story that would raise the back of your head oh. as to why it would be so important to get it to kids at a young age. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can that's I what we're on. That this is exactly what I was hoping for? that Mary, Helen, and I wouldn't talk as much because this is the part, like that connection piece between people. Um, I had no idea that you guys knew each other or that these connections are happening. So that's one of my favorite parts. Sorry, I interrupted, but 
keep going. I want to, I want to learn more about restorative justice. Well, you know what would, and it's kind of funny because, or not funny, but it's always good timing, right? When we were saying, you know, I don't know how many signed up, but don't, there's only six of us here. It's the way it's supposed to be, right? Maybe some That's will right. come in after, but it kind of ties in what we're talking about today about our strengths and our, in our blind spots. I mean, these things need to be learned at a young age because it, the more you know yourself, the less likely. I don't know if that's true. I don't know, Caroline or Annette, you could speak to that. But I think that if we were given the chance to be more accepting of who we are and that, yes, we have blind spots and yes, we have strengths, I think we'll come out of it a much better, well-rounded person by the time we're out of frickin' school. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you agree? I definitely agree. I think it's about, um, I think it's about learning about each other. You know, when I think about, um, I, I, when I was with Alberta Ed and Mary was there too, I did a lot of work with um, bullying, which is a word that I really don't like. But um, when you talk to kids, they will tell you that they're way less likely to be mean or unkind to somebody they know something about. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, in their minds, it's pretty simple, but how do we intentionally create time and space for that to happen and to learn how to truly listen to other people, even if we don't necessarily agree. Or even if you, I mean, as the, as the educators, you know, you're, you really, your, your window of time is so small with these children is if you can make that impact, because now we're dealing with adults who don't know how to speak to one another and who don't accept each other's differences and all of those. Yeah. Yeah. Not an easy role. Yeah. Helen, it kind of reminds me of that whole idea of, yes, I agree with what you're saying, but are we even teaching how do we talk about our individual strengths? How do we talk about our shortcomings, our blind spots? I, 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 I know in some of our curriculum, it is addressed, but I don't think that we invest in the commitment to really becoming transparent with who we are, you know, our experiences. And yes, sometimes they don't define our lives, but do we talk about, you know, this whole activity and looking at what are our blind spots, what are our strengths? You know, I push myself a little bit to actually involve our daughters in this process because there's some uncomfortableness with the idea of strengths and, and, and are we comfortable enough to be able to kind of say, here are my strengths. Um, here are some areas that I'm really great at without feeling confident or cocky or condescending and the flip side of that is are we brave enough to identify what our shortcomings are or do we even know what they are and does what Christy see in my blind spot the same as what I see and so I think we've got a lot of work to do at a very young age starting in kindergarten to be able to kind of embed that in our curriculum mm -hmm. and conversations. Well, in my background, grade one specifically, and you can have a lot of conversations at different levels. So um, one of the things that I did in grade seven, as well as grade one is hugs and bugs. And that was when I get feedback from students, like let's talk about grade seven who have now graduated. That was the time they remember when our class once a week would sit together and talk about what's something you're proud of, what's something you're happy about, what's something you're looking forward to. It doesn't have to be complicated, but then also having a chance to talk about something that's bugging you and the problem solving that could happen from there and where they would hear that it's happening maybe to somebody else or um, maybe a child would never bring up what was going on for them, but they would hear similar instances. It often had to do with siblings in grade one. I have to tell you, their siblings <laughs> made them crazy, but the opportunity to talk about it and support them in problem solving those kinds of things, because I love my children. I don't have the patience to always manage everything every day. So Nana comes, thanks Nana, and she handles them. And then we get to talk about things in a different way and having those different people in their lives to talk about things in different ways, I think is really important as well. I guess that comes down to the old saying, it takes a village, right? Yeah. 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 You know, when um, the, the work that my husband and I do in the prison setting is pretty phenomenal. And and one of the strengths that I've that I have is my fearlessness to do things and to be involved with people that other people ordinarily wouldn't be involved with. And that 
in the in the prison setting, my husband and I have developed a seminar where we work with men and women serving life sentences for murder. And who would have ever believed that I'd come from that from having a brother that was died by homicide that I would have be able to go in and work with men and women serving life sentences. And and Cal, Cal, uh, Caroline, just to feed into your story there, I mean, what you do in school, which I, and, and you too, Christy, so powerful. One day when we were there working with a group of lifers and I was talking about bitterness because bitterness is, you know, we batter ourselves with bitterness. And I talked about bitterness and, and how it's like a snowball rolling off a mountain. And when it crashes, it's like an avalanche. And one of the guys that was in our group, I could tell that he was getting really emotional. And suddenly he spoke and it, he spoke up and I said, you have something to tell us? And he said, yes, if only, if only somebody had told me as a young child that I didn't need to hang on to all this bitterness, maybe, yeah. maybe I wouldn't have killed my whole family. Oh my God. Wow. Well, you know, and that comes down to that piece too, like where oh, this is like where it's not just what's your strength and what it's coming down to all of our experiences. Yeah. And that's why I'm so passionate about what I talk about, because, you know, just based on my childhood, I should be living in a, I mean, I hate the, I, I should just be living in some kind of community where I have, you know, seven children with six different men and I'm no teeth and I smoke and I'm like 600, uh. but really, but you sit there and you think, okay, so there has to be some good that comes out of it. You have to make use of your disaster. And in order to do that, you have to forgive and you have to grieve and you have to do, and we don't talk about it enough. I mean, we're starting no. to now because we're all just human. We all share the same emotions, whether they're in check or have been developed properly or all of those things, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, um, when you're talking, I mean, we're just so judgmental as a society, I think. And we just do not accept other people's journeys for some reason, you know? We were also yeah. smiling. I could see Mary and I were both like, Helen's painting a picture for us right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm also the storyteller, <laughs> but yeah, but you know, like what made the difference for me, what made the diff, how did I get to live the life? I've, I've got an incredible life. Uh, how did that happen? Based on what my childhood was That's based right. on, because that brought the choices that took me into my, my young adulthood into my, as I'm getting older and older, I'd love to tell you, I'm going to be 60, you know, in two weeks. And it's like, uh, oh yeah, I'm still learning. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I'm still forgiving myself for things. Oh, I still have to forgive people for that. How, and every once in a while, it's like, how did I get so lucky? And that again, is we don't give our, like you were saying, Mary, we don't give ourselves enough credit for the work we've yeah. done. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a gr growth mindset in a big way too, like the way that you approach life. And I was wondering, as you were talking, if there was somebody in your life that you're remembering that maybe stepped in. So even though the situation wasn't always ideal, was there a person that maybe taught you some of the, oh yeah, she's like, yeah, let me tell you. When I was 12 years old, I, um, I mean, I don't know who hasn't read my book here. Caroline, I don't think has. I know Cheryl did. Annette, I know you have. Christy, mm -hmm. you have. Mary, I think you have. I was in such a, in, I was in such a state of anxiety, which was never a thing when I was a kid. I was such a mess that I just, I was running away from home since I was five years old because my home was so dysfunctional and so full of anger and so much, sadness and everything and I phoned I might cry I phoned um there was a family that I met when I was 12 um mom and dad T and I phoned dad T and I said I've had enough and he mm. said do you want me to come and get you and I said yeah and he saved my life because mm -hmm. I do not know what would have happened to that 12 wow. year old mm -hmm. had he not been there for me yeah yeah 
I'm totally remembering all of those details now about the book. Yeah. And he was the most wonderful man. Yeah, he's been gone now for two years, um, but he saved my life. And maybe I would have met someone else down the road that would have. My son would be the other person. Yeah. Look so, at you! Look at you beam when you say even oh, the word "my son." Oh, <laughs> yeah. My heart. What about you guys? Do you have somebody in your life that made that kind of a difference? I'm like looking at my mom. I'm waiting for her to answer. Mm-hmm. Everybody else mm-hmm. can answer too, but these are the kind of questions you don't usually talk about with your family. And like, well, it's interesting because I grew up in a. I mean, you know, mom was fairly negative. You know, you everything was. Don't think you're pretty. You're never gonna, you know, you're never gonna amount to much. You might as well go to secretarial school because you can't, you're not smart enough for anything else. That's how it, sort of thing, you know, she was it was always negative comments. And I s- sort of started living that. And then I remember meeting um Sarah and Brian Lewis, their Owen's Vancouver. parents down yeah. in, in Vancouver. And she showed us sort of, you know, just by example, showed me that you don't have to be negative every time your kids do something wrong. So her kid, one of her kids attacks another one with a knife. She goes, ah, Owen, stop it. You know, <laughs> she, they really did. You know, <laughs> I remember that family. That would definitely but happen. Was, she was able to just let it go, you know, and, and, and I, that was something I really learned from her and it made a big difference to how my parenting went forward after that. I didn't have to take it so seriously all the time, you know? Interesting. Not, I, I would have if you tried to kill each other, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> but she was she showed me a different way of dealing with it than my parents you know mm-hmm. my parents were big on capital punishment or corporal punishment and you know she wasn't yeah. wow anybody else it, have a it's ama- it, i think it's amazing how when we sit back and reflect of the ind- reflect on the individuals that have made an impact on our lives you know and you chrissy just even posing that question to the audience here um you know who's made a difference do we all have people that that make that difference for us and I don't know if we often stop and think about that I mean Caroline I know that you do some extensive work um, around this whole concept you know who is that web of support that you have that you know lifts you up when you are down or walks alongside you when things are going well and um, yeah I I just love Cheryl that um, you know you took that opportunity to kind of share that with us Christy, did you know that story? That, no, that I didn't question. know that story. <laughs> yeah. And I also think it's interesting that you just mentioned a web because like, Mary, you have a person here. Helen, you have a person here and I have a person here. And then some of the connections that have happened across yes. those um, yeah, are really interesting yeah. as well, right? And Mary, you were talking kind of, I was just at a book club for Dare to Lead, like right before this. And we were talking about the square squad idea. And the people that are my square squad are definitely different than the person in my past that made a big impact. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Um, yes. And when I think about that question, I, uh, mom, I go back to Mr. Talikas in grade six, like maybe three years ago, I sent my grade six teacher a gratitude letter and just talked about what a difference he made, like his teaching style. And I didn't know if I was sending it to the right person. I just kind of threw it out there and it got to him. And just like the conversation that we then had after, I mean, I'd never seen him again after grade seven probably, but um, it was a huge impact into how I taught and went forward. And I don't know, I, that, that kind of like um, Martin Seligman, positive psychology, gratitude piece is really important in my life. And I think that we definitely don't say it enough. Like, mom, I would love you to randomly find Sarah Lewis and tell her that she changed your parenting journey because I don't think we hear those stories enough no. about the impact that we've had, right? Yeah, and you might not even you? realize. You might not even realize who yeah. you have changed. Mm-hmm. Mm. That um, it's interesting, Mary, that you brought that up because I've been I've been doing some I've done some work in the past with a gentleman named per- Derek Peterson, and he has this integrated youth development model. But um, I was just doing kind of an intensive ten week course with him, and it's all about um, it's all about supporting youth. And he talks about webs of support and how um, youth and for that matter adults 
need five anchors in their lives. So we, you know, we always hear about you need one adult. He's like, yeah, that's a great start. But what if something happens to that one adult? Yeah. So it's really about needing five. And he talks about um, being thickly webbed or thinly webbed. And but anyway, it was interesting through this course because I realized that I really didn't have much of a web growing up. And so it's just really interesting how you think about then what does that mean for what you create later in your life? So um, it was just really eye-opening to go back to when I was in school and think about that. It's like, hmm. But, you know, I mean, whatever. I made it, so it was all good. But it's just, it, it speaks to then what you do um, when you get older. So anyway, it's just, it was a really interesting little <clears throat> journey to go on with uh, with Derek. It's a really great group of people, and it was a lot of fun. But but now I mentor somebody else, and it's it's interesting to watch. Um, just to watch that relationship and to watch her grow. And <laughs> Mary knows Amber, and she can be uh, she can be a challenge. But I think that that's you know that's part of it. Is then then what do we do to give back? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you have to. Um, when, when does the awareness come in that you have the ability to give back, right? Instead of being like like Cheryl said, not not always negative. When do you get to be that positive in someone else's life? And I think you have to be very aware and make a choice that that's what you're going to do. Not an easy thing to do. It seems easy, but it's not, is it? You know, I'd, I'd like to just build on that, Helen, about choices, because I believe that, you know, we don't have, we may not have a choice in what happens to us in life, but we always have a choice in how we respond. And I mean, I've gone through a lot of really tough stuff, a lot of trials and trauma and tragedies, but I've come through it and I'm so grateful for life. And it's given me a passion to help other people rise above and push through and, and forgive and let go. Um, but you know who the hero was in my life was my dad. My dad believed in me. He told me I could do anything I wanted to do. He said, never, your, your voice is important. Never, never be afraid to stand up and voice your opinion. And, you know, I guess that's where my fearlessness comes from, too, is that he believed in me and gave me opportunities for, you know, to, to develop myself that were phenomenal. But and, you believe but, in you too, and that that's the power. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And and I think I think the the things that I've come through, I use the power of choice to to come through them. I it I mean, you know, I'm a deeply spiritual person as well. And so I have God in my life, but I also made positive choices. And and I think that that's that's something that, you know, you as teachers and as grandparents and parents, we need to help young people understand they always have a choice and they can make positive choices. A lot of times people don't realize that they have a choice when they've come through a diff, you know, when they've encountered a really difficult situation. I think and that's when they need those people around them. Pardon me. And that's when the young people need those people around them. Absolutely, really Caroline. Choice when you don't have any kind of support. That's right. So. That's right. And it can be, you know, a teacher making, you know, like you said, Cheryl, it can be someone, it doesn't even have to be monumental, but somehow that, that pearl sticks, you know, it sticks with them and impacts them. So... That sounds great. So I'm going to be the devil's advocate. So, <laughs> so um, what happens and what can we do for the people who weren't lucky enough to have those angels, those earth angels, and now they're adults and they've made poor choices and mm -hmm. Is there a way, and I know, Annette, you do with the work, the tremendous work that you and Clay do in the prison system, but what are we talking about people who aren't in the prison system, who haven't done something so, so outside of what is considered, you know, being productive in life? 
what do we do as people who are walking around? And I think there's a lot of it, and I think COVID has brought it out, is people who are so tremendously unhappy and so sad that they don't even know that there is that other side, as I always like to say, the other side of the river. Mm -hmm. How do we get to those people? Because you know, we all well know, you can't tell someone anything. They have to be the ones that go, oh my God, I can't live like this anymore. How do you get to those people? Is that me being idealistic and funny in the, in the Enneagram? My sign is the one who has this almost altruistic view of the world, which is not realistic. You know what I mean? I'm also wondering, hold that question too. Annette and Cheryl and Caroline, have you done the Enneagram? Yep. Yeah, you know what I did, but I went back to look at my results and I can't access them anymore. <laughs> yeah. um, I pulled mine out today and just really scanned it quickly. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. don't know if you have to pay and do it again to get your results back. I think to get the full results, you have to do it again. Um, but I but did it and had them, but then oh. they don't, I guess they don't keep them for you. Oh, really? I think you have to download them. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. So I, I think I may have downloaded it. mine. I don't know, but I printed it off at the time. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I did, but now I don't have it. Sorry, oh, just okay. a quick question because we'll come back to that. But yeah, back to uh, Helen's question. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, is it too wild, idealistic to say to someone, oh my gosh, there's so much peace and happiness in this world. And if you would just do the work, that is the thing, the single thing I struggle with the most with my business is that I cannot help someone who doesn't want to do the work there's no magic pill there's no fit i'm not going to blow fairy dust and tell you you're going to be okay i don't get to decide that but i see it in some people they just take off man then they're they are on the other side and it's so freeing but then the other ones you see them going no 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 it's too painful but it's interesting because your role there they would have come to you Right. So they are at least taking that step mm -hmm. and they maybe aren't ready for all of it. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> Yet. Right. Yeah. It's that planting the seed. Yeah. Yeah. I also and think, modeling too, I think just, uh, just in your own uh, disposition and the, the things you do, you kind of model what you mm -hmm. would like people to do. <laughs> I know. To see people, be. Well, people say, Oh my God, how did you manifest? You manifested that. And I'm like, Okay, sure, but I, I sure did. To, I <laughs> sure did, but I worked damn hard to get what I have too. It was not easy, yes. believe me, right? And that's the thing is you don't want to you don't want to kind of come out and go, yes, but the work you have to do to get there is a whole different level that you have to be prepared to do, and a lot of people aren't prepared to do it. I think it's with people too. I think people. I think some people have had a history where people give up on them. Yeah. Yes. So I think it's sticking with them and people like Mary said, will come to it at their own time, not there yet. Yeah. But I think, you know, lots of people have that experience of when they're not moving fast enough or whatever it is, then people just give up on them and they have a history of that. So that's a good point. You know, my husband and I work in a, we do once a month, we spend a full day at an addiction recovery center in high river. I mean, absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal experience. But carrying on with what you've said, Helen, the women that come there, they have finally gotten to the point, either they're, they're at the bottom of the barrel and the only way is up and they make a choice to come mm -hmm. and then we can reach them. Yeah. People that come to seminars or hear me speak or, or read my book, they are in searching for something searching for something yeah and i think it's a process you know um, you're right this this is not a sprint it is a marathon and you know as mentors or as sponsors or as individuals who have some strength because i know tonight we're talking about strengths and potential blind spots um how do we cheryl i love what you said how do we model and mentor very authentically and how do we check in with people mm -hmm. without a prescription? And how do we enhance our listening skills? I mean, that's one area that I'm trying to really work hard on. And 
um, you know, that blind spot piece kind of kicked me in the butt when I read this and I talked to my kids about what they thought my, my strengths were and my blind spots were, but are we truly great listeners where we listen with the intent of understanding and not responding and not trying to fix and not trying to say, have you tried and how about, and things are great and, you know, things will be great. You know, there's that, you know, Michaela, one of our daughters talked about the, you know, toxic positivity. And she goes, mom, don't take this personally. You know, I don't mean that, you know, you don't have a lot of strengths, but sometimes you just need to listen and not kind of say, we've got this, you know, we're going to work at this together. Some people don't want to listen to that because they're not ready for it. And I went, oh shit. <laughs> That's true. Right? You know, Thank you, see, you. you know, it's true. You see it. I see it on Facebook, that lovely Facebook where um, someone is struggling with uh, the loss of a spouse or, um, um, and Annette, you can tell this story, but, or they're dealing with cancer and someone's like, you've got this girl, you've got this, you're going to get this, you're going to beat it. Oh my gosh. That's yeah. very toxic positivity. And yeah, it is really it is. interesting. So some of the medical moms, I know the heart moms, I, this took me by surprise because I am a bit toxically positive for sure. I know that about myself, but this mom was like, if somebody else tells me I'm strong, I'm going to lose my shit. Yeah. And just for me, that's never been an issue, but the way people talk about it, like everyone takes different issues with different words, I guess is another piece. Um, and yeah. if you've just been told that too many times and it's just like that superficial um, side of a comment, it, it loses its meaning too. Yeah, and I think there's no malintent for sure. And that's no, one of no, the big no, no. things yeah. about grief is that when someone says, well, at least you have this. Okay, that's true, but that's not up to you to say it. And it certainly mm -hmm. isn't your timing. Your timing's off. And one of the things I do in my course, it's called Zip It. And that tell the story about when your um, brother passed away and someone said about the garden that God needed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't about my brother, but it was somebody else that had passed away. And this person said, oh, God needed another flower in his garden. I just, oh, <laughs> hello. <laughs> If Mary's giggling, I know it's good. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, and, and I think from their perspective, they probably thought I need yeah. to say this just to make somebody feel good. And, you know, I believe in God and God has a beautiful garden and he's just adopted the orchid. And, and, and so again, from the perspective of individuals, right? I think the other piece for me is valuing individualism. And just because I want to say something because I think it's going to make that other person feel better. I need to not think about what I want. I need to be thinking about what they may need. So that's kind of a tricky piece. Because you know, really you know people people mean someone. well and they want yeah. to be helpful and they want to they want to somehow soothe people in their anguish, whether it's a health concern or whether it's the loss of a loved one. They're wanting to to help and smooth things over and and they don't mean they just don't understand what that statement is that they're making and you know you mentioned a minute ago you know you got this you got this i have a very good friend in california 37 year old uh very advanced ovarian cancer has uh attacked the the lining of her abdomen it's in her lungs and now is at the base of her brain and people are saying to her, oh, you got this. She's an optometrist, has just opened up a beautiful practice two years ago. Oh, you've got this. You've got this. You know, they, they want to encourage and uplift. But there's, you know, there, I guess there are other things that a person could say. Well, there's also that little element in there of fear for the person. Oh, who yeah. Can handle someone else's emotion. Yeah, right? and when you absolutely. 30, there you have a 37 year old who's got that horrific, disgusting disease. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, it just becomes so real. And it's like, please, I don't want to get it. So you have to be, yeah, I think there's that fear in there as well. Yeah. My and and, and wanting, to, wanting them to, you know, wanting to buoy their spirits. I mean, she's a, she's a very positive woman, but she's also very real because she knows what's happening in her life. But anyway, 
And my hope is that she has other people that know how she works and what she needs. And that's not like, it's, I think it's harder when that is the person that you're turning to for support um, rather than kind of somebody on the outside, I guess. Um, Mm -hmm. So my hope is that she has somebody else that she She has lots, she has lots of people. And that's a wonderful thing. So I think I'd like to throw something out there. We've got about uh, 15 ish minutes. No, 15 ish minutes. Is that, is it? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So today's session is about um, all of this incredible conversation and connections, because that is about building community. We've talked about um, strengths um, kind of almost covertly, not really overtly in listening to some of the stories that we've been, you know, sharing and, you know, some of us kind of talked about their blind spot. Oops, like, okay, I'm going to make sure that I'd be aware of that. Um, what did you think when you were invited to kind of come to this session? And um, what might be a strength of yours that you'd like to share with everybody and or a blind spot that you um, were identified on that Enneagram? You know, I read that and I kind of went, okay, I need another glass of wine today <laughs> because so much of this, of this is so bloody true. And it's one piece of information I think that we need to kind of really look at these assessments to be able to kind of say, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Put it away for a bit. Uh, I don't know about this one, but mine was pretty accurate. And when my kids told me about um, that whole positive and caring and love, loving person that I am, you know, the strengths, it was a double-edged sword because that also can become that blind spot that um, I needed to hear about. So I'm turning it over to somebody else. Crickets. Blind spot. <laughs> yes. Well, I think you're right, Mary. I think that it's a, uh, a strength can also be a curse. I'm not going first. <laughs> no, I went I, first. You know what? I, I went first. That would be you going second. <laughs> you know, I think um, in some ways similar to Mary, it's that idea of um, just listening and not jumping to fix or give advice. And, you know, I think my daughter is good about that. She'll say to me, I, you know, I, I don't want you, I don't, I don't want you to do anything except listen. I just want to talk about yeah. that. And I yeah. think it's hard. It's hard, especially with your kids, because you, you don't want to watch them struggle with an issue or struggle with a decision. But the bottom line is you can't make it for them. So you just have to be there and support and watch them struggle as difficult as it is. I'm discovering I'm better at doing that with, people that I'm not close to, like my daughter, it's like kids at school. I had way more patience for somebody else's grade eight girl than I did for my own. But, <laughs> um, but I think that's something too, to, that I need to work on is that just, just being present, just listening, not fixing. I keep rereading that Margaret Wheatley article. One day it'll help me. <laughs> well, I think that's a, I, I think that's a female thing too, is we're fixers, right? Yeah. And, um, and one of the things that I learned in coaching, it's called I thou. And it's like, when there's two people, you, you don't matter when you're the coach, it doesn't matter what you, what your experiences have been and what your notions are. This is about this person and you are to stay curious and keep asking questions. That's how they find the answers. But I think it's a really hard thing to do when you're female, because that's what we do. We're, we're caregivers. We jump in, especially when it's our children. For sure. Like I I get, yeah, I get super passionate about everything. Like I'm all in man all the time. Right. And yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah. And I think (laughs) that, (laughs) and I mean that in a positive way. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, that's a definitely a blessing, but it's also a curse because not everyone else is all in. Yeah. And they're not ready to be all in. So, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, I just had a, an experience with my daughter-in-law who, you know, when your son marries, you have to take a back, you, you're, you have to step back as the mother because the dynamic changes and it must change. Yeah. But I will tell you, my daughter-in-law is a beautiful human being. She, um, she wanted to call a family meeting because she said, just because of stuff that's been going on just a couple of weeks ago, I told Cheryl this story, but she said, you know, you're pushing people away. You're pushing us away and we miss you and we love you. And she is so opposite of me. I said to her, I kind of feel like you think I'm this knife wielding mother-in-law. She goes, not at all, but you handle things much more uh, openly than 
than I do. And it's not that it scares me. It's just that I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. thought, wow, there's, mm -hmm. and she mm -hmm. is totally different than me. She's very quiet. She's very observant where I'm just kind of like all the time. <laughs> and I thought, wow, do I have a lot of respect for her? And we had a, such an, a mature conversation, which I can tell you is not a Helen thing. I'm very, you know, emotional all the time. Christy's laughing, but I am, I'm just kind of black. I don't know if that's the Greek in, in me. I don't know, but I mean, French mother, Greek father raised by Italians, you know, very passionate, outspoken, kind of just let it all out and then everything's fine, but that's not fine for someone else who's not mm. used to that. So it's very humbling to sit and think, oh man, that's what you were saying, Mary. It's like, oh, well, you too, Caroline, it's sort of like, oh man, you know, you've just got up, right? Yeah. Well, when I was going through the Enneagram and, you know, my strengths, I've, you know, I'm gung ho and I go with my heart and I'm fearless and I'm able to do lots of things. But the core, one of my core weaknesses is that believing that I'm only as good as the image I present to the world. Mary, she's and with us. Mary, she's with that? us. I think what's we that? have the same one. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that right? And, and you know, that, I mean, I, I, real, I realize it. I realize it. Just on Sunday, I was part of a podcast and had problems that it was supposed to be a, a Facebook live. And she was on Facebook live and invited me in but somehow my computer, it wouldn't work. We could not get it to work. And finally I shut it down and I went to my cell phone. Well, I wasn't set up to do it with my cell phone. And here I was struggling, but you see it. And when I looked, up, when I looked at it afterwards, I mean, I saw all the flaws in it. And my, here my cell phone suddenly was starting to die and my cord was not long enough to get over to where I had my, co my phone. And here I was digging in my drawer, trying to find the battery charger. And, and so I was picking up on those flaws in myself. And it was, you know, I wrote about it on Facebook and, you know, I laugh at myself and I called her the next day and we laughed about what was happening for us that day. But I don't like to not look good. <laughs> and in the moment, getting, how it no feels. One, yeah. yeah. Probably no one even noticed in that. We've all fumbled when that damn cord in our phones at 1% and we can't find our cord. No one was going to go, oh, that's, what's wrong with Annette Stanwyck? Right? <laughs> well, but she and she I mean? was like, trying. We're harder on ourselves than, than we need to And be. I think you're right. But she was, you know, when, when she was trying to bring me in, she'd say, well, try hitting this and I'd try hitting that and try it, try this and try that. And her daughter came in and try this and try that. And, oh, none of it was working. And I've got to figure that out. Why? And the heck, it wouldn't work. <laughs> but it, yeah. And so I didn't look good in my own eyes. I didn't look good in my own eyes. But yet the message was there. And that's, that's what I'm grabbing onto, that the message was there and it was strong and I could keep going, even though I was struggling with all this stuff or chaos around me, I could still speak and talk and, but, uh, but I, I really realized that that's a, you know, perfectionism is a, is, you know, something that I struggle with. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. That's one of my big blind spots that I wasn't ready for when I first read through the Enneagram results. Yeah. I yeah. told these ladies I had done it for another course and I was like, this makes me uncomfortable. I'm quite upset about what, <laughs> like, I just, I wasn't ready to handle that information. And now that I've worked through oh, it a few times, okay. like it was too close to home for me. So uh -huh. I never would have thought image would be one of my big blind spots. But once I read through it a bit more and spent some more time with it, I recognized like, yeah, I do. I do see that about myself. I do know that I want to present well for whatever reason and things like that would make me crazy. And it doesn't, I, for me, it doesn't need to be perfect, but it needs to be not chaos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I was, you know, I, I felt 
I was able to laugh about it the next day. Yeah. And, you know, after I watched the whole thing and, and saw, saw what was going on and I, knowing what I was, you know, how I was struggling to make it work. And, you know, you don't even know half the stuff. <laughs> I didn't have a, anything to put my, my cell phone on. And so here I had a, had a CD and I had a book behind it and it kept falling and oh boy. <laughs> but, you know, uh, but I was able to laugh about it the next day and let it go. Rather well, I than think be- that, that sense of humor part, I think every person here has some of that that can look back and say like, okay, I can laugh about that and find yes, something yes. that you're okay with about the whole idea. But do you think, yeah. and that kind of circles around to what we were talking about earlier. So we know all of these things. So here, here, and it's on paper and it's like, oh my God, someone else knows what I don't like. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> and so, but right. And then, yeah, that's and then right. you're sitting and going, well, but people might see a little part the polished version. And I talk about that quite a bit too. It's like, we're all seeing each other's polished version. Good God, if we yeah. were in each other's heads, the way we talk to, uh, you know, talk to ourselves about, oh, I'm this, I'm not, and this, I'm not. Oh, we, we'd all be wandering around like freaking zombies. But that's the whole thing is that's the beauty of it is get, you got your polished version and then you know what's really in here. Yeah. you know, uh, Right. And so when you're reading, it's like, oh man, I don't like this mirror. Yeah. Even though there's some really good things in it, right? Well, one of my favorite parts about this whole idea was that when it talked about your main trait, it then went into, I'm just pulling it up, the spectrum of health. And it talked about what that main trait looked like if you were stressed versus if you were kind of, um, what did they say? Average or thriving. And so yeah. even though it would be the same word, like, for example, I'm three, self-confident if I'm like in a good space, but that can also be competitive. And if I'm stressed, that can also be superficial. And so the way they took a single Uh word and put it across, like where you are at, um, with the things going on around you and for you, um, it was just really interesting to see how the same word can be placed like three different ways with positive and negative. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's important for us to do some introspection and see how that applies. It doesn't mean we're bad people, but it just helps us to understand ourselves a bit more, you know, like in relation to viewing relationships as an important goal to be achieved. That's a good thing. But if I've got a relationship that I cannot for the life of me fix, then I th- there's something wrong with me because I am, I'm all about relationships. And so I beat up on myself because this one relationship that's an important relationship in my life, I can't fix it. But yet it's not, I realize it's, a, it's her problem with me is not about me. It's about her. Yeah. <laughs> but I, but I still blame myself and carry some shame because here's this woman that, is good at relationships, pretty good, pretty good at relationships, not perfect, but she can't fix this one. Well, it goes down to that. If a thousand people don't like you and, or a thousand people love you and one doesn't, you're going to focus on that one person. Oh yeah. You're right. You're right, Ellen. Yeah. Well, I like you guys. It's, it just happens to be a sister-in-law. So that makes it hard. Oh, I mean better. (laughs) I'm wondering how everybody felt about some of the strategies that they came up with in looking at your profile. Like I take a look at, you know, strategies that you might enhance goals uh, or tasks um, to get you going into kind of that next level of growth. Um, How did you guys find those? Did you find that they were helpful? I mean, um, is there one that you're focusing on as you take a look at your strength and or your blind spot? Um, there's one that stands up for me and I went, holy crap, like, does somebody actually know me in this? And, you know, the one growth area for me is, you know, fail often and make those mistakes and allow mm-hmm. them to be who you are and not yeah. become the perfectionist that you are. And so I thought, yeah, so I don't know. So how did, did any of you feel um, that any of those growth tasks for either your threes or your fours um, would be something you would be focusing on as a goal? 
Yeah, mine was uh, doing is your blind spot and get off the hamster wheel, which Mary, you probably had that under yours as well. So it's interesting when you have the same as somebody else and which ones stand out for you, even though ours were likely the same list. Um, but yeah, get off the hamster wheel. Yeah. I'm looking forward to delving deeper into that conversation on the 30th with you guys, because yeah, there yeah, are some things in there that I'm kind of going, oh, shit, what? Okay. Yeah, Tell me, yeah, me too. But that's what I was saying earlier, when you're standing on this side of the river and you haven't done the mud, and then all of a sudden you do some of it and you're on the other side, it doesn't mean you're not going to end up back here again. It just means when you end up back here, I, I'll quite often say, you know, you take 10 steps forward and then something happens and it triggers and you go back to, you know, your old way and you're back seven mm -hmm. steps. You don't mm -hmm. stay there long once you've kind of slogged through the mud enough to go, ah, hold on. This is a trigger. I'm doing this, right? Sometimes you stay longer. I'm speaking from personal experience, but most of the time you're, you know, you're kind of just doing all these, this self-talk in your brain. Yeah. Too bad you couldn't transcribe the stuff that you that you run through your brain on a daily look at christy oh but god if you, if you transcribe i don't that, think anything can write that fast well no but can you imagine after reading it i know when i did a journal during my divorce i actually uh shredded it about five years after because i thought oh my god if i died and people read this i guess i would <laughs> have been in the freaking nut house right oh. <laughs> right because of just all of the stuff that's just you know talking in that hell loop that you get in yeah well, ladies, it's 8.30, so Aww. I think we might have to do this again in the future. Yeah, oh, it was good. Yeah, really nice to have all of you on. We don't have a plan about what our next one is. <laughs> We're just winging it right now, but this was, this was really nice, so thank you so much for joining us. Mary, did you want to say anything? I was just going to say, you know, we did send you a placemat with some reflective questions. If you're thinking about a goal that you'd like to set for yourself, I think the questions were, you know, from today's conversation, what stood out for you? Um, Christy, do you have that handy? I do. Holding okay. it right now. Yeah, go ahead. Do right you want to read through some of that? Yeah. And, you know, um, Christy can read through some of those questions. But again, I love coming to these things, whether they be one on one, one on some, one on 50, one on 100. What are we all thinking about as we think about ourselves and what are our strengths and what's an area that we'd like to kind of focus on, um, you know, pertaining to that blind spot or that growth area. Um, so yeah, if, if you have any questions about that place match, please let us know. Christy, anything else on there that we need to kind of share? Yeah, do you want me to read through a couple of them? Oh, yeah, that, sure, that'd be great. Yeah, so things like as you reflect on today's conversation, what resonates with you? Uh, and reflecting on the conversation today on strengths and blind spots, what are some of your strengths and superpowers and what are some of your blind spots? Um, have your views changed after having this conversation? And what are some next steps that you're going to take back um, related to your strengths or blind spots? So next steps and anticipated changes that might come out of it. So just um, for those of you that don't know Mary well yet, she is amazing at getting you to reflect on what the conversation has been about. So um, yeah, this, this might be something that we do a future episode on because I actually have done a leadership training with Mary before and the placemat had been there, but she mentioned it on a podcast the other day and I was like, oh, I forgot. This is a great way to do this where it's not a lot of information it's just a few questions on a placemat and that's something that i really i personally like a small job to do sometimes or not at all you don't have to use it but it, again it's that reflection piece i love i love opportunities to chat and talk and reflect and share and i mean and part of one of my one of my weaker points is that you know it, it's a strength that i'm i'm fearless and i you know i do have a voice and i do i'm willing to speak up but maybe sometimes i'm insensitive to to others as well and i can come across maybe and i it, in the enneagram i can come across as intimidating never do i intend to be intimidating that's not my that's not my purpose or my focus but so these kinds of, you know, this kinds of discussion in a small group is really good. I think I love it. 
-hmm. And we're meant for connection. <laughs> we're well, wired for I connection. Love, about all of this is it like mary said if there's one ten a thousand however many a hundred people the thing is is what i love about this always is that we're not alone that's yeah. a really big thing for me that in fact is one of my biggest things on the enneagram is the fear of the loan and so mm. these things are really powerful for me because it makes you realize that you aren't alone yes you may have the uh, a fear, but however you handle it is differently, but you still, other people have it. That's the thing I love the most. And of course, yeah. Okay, well, on that note, I want everybody to wave and smile and I'm gonna turn off the recording. You're not alone. <laughs>